Good evening and welcome to the Coon Rapids City Council meeting for Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. If you could please rise and join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Councilmember Griscoviak. Here. Councilmember Ray Rauer. Here. Councilmember Hernandez Jr. Here. Councilmember Geisler. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Carlson. Here. Mayor Cook. Here. Thank you. Uh, next item is to adopt this evening's agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Griscoviak, second by Ray Rauer to adopt this evening's agenda. Any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the agenda is adopted. And the first item on this evening's agenda is the swearing in of new police officers. Turn it over to Chief Wise. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, for the, those at home that are watching on TV, we have a full house tonight. It's kind of nice. Uh, lots of people are very interested in the swearing in of our officers, and we certainly appreciate that because it's an important sign to me on a personal level. So Mayor, Council, uh, City staff, citizens of Coon Rapids, as the Coon Rapids Police Chief, um, it is our tradition to take a few minutes um, this evening to formally introduce our newest police officers on their graduation from our field training program. It's so important that we do this as the relationship our officers have with their citizens matters. Um, but it's maybe even more important on the level uh, of that in particular the officers, the relationship they have with their city council. They just need to see for themselves and experience for themselves the support that they have from both this entity and the city staff and those that are in our community. Um, it's a strong bond and we work very hard at having that and we plan on keeping that. Officer candidates can choose where they want to go and I, I assure you that they pay attention to those sorts of things so it means a great deal to them. So tonight I am introducing officers Anthony Podkapatz and officer Kevin Noches. So to my to the far end there, uh, uh, Anthony grew up in Coon Rapids, Minnesota and graduated from Coon Rapids High School. Of course, my alma mater is yours, Mr. Mayor. Uh, while in high school, Anthony had the occasion to be exposed to the law enforcement profession in a class at the high school's uh, secondary technical education program or their STEP program. Again, when we talk about future officers for our agency, we're looking for those opportunities to make a connection wherever we can. And we're appreciative that the high school gives kids that opportunity to explore the idea of being a police officer. Uh, but like many of us, his uh, work history started in a rather random way where you start working a variety of jobs until you figure out where your passion would lead him. That passion led him to law enforcement where he attended Alexandria Technical and Community College and earned an Associate of Arts degree in law enforcement. And he also completed his skills program there. After that, he started working as a security officer in Mercy Hospital here in town where he was eventually promoted to a supervisory uh, position. He honed his skills there until the opportunity came for him to come work here at Coon Rapids Police. And just as a side note, um, I knew he was the right guy to hire in the most odd circumstances that um, one of my responsibilities is managing dog bite incidents. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but in reality it is. And there was an incident at Mercy Hospital that Anthony's name was associated with. And I read the report and was impressed by how thorough it was. And then coincidentally, he was one of our applicants to be an officer here. So you never know where in life your path kind of wanders and where those important connections get, uh, get made. But honing those skills at the hospital translates nicely into being a patrol officer here in Coon Rapids. And, and we're lucky to have him here for, for, um, to do this work for us. All right, standing next to me immediately is uh, Kevin Noches. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that relationship piece too. Although Kevin first lived in New Brighton as a really young child, his family soon moved to Coon Rapids, which also is a place that he calls his hometown. So I think you're sensing a theme here. We scored two Coon Rapids kids, which I really like. Um, he also graduated from Coon Rapids. Kevin had the occasion to be exposed to the law, <laughs> law enforcement profession in a couple of ways. One he mentioned in his autobiography was being impacted by um, a godfather of his when he was really young and that uh, godfather was a St. Paul police officer and then he made that connection between the squad car, the bright lights 
and being fascinated as a kid. And again, it's part of the reason why we send squad cars out to various community events and let kids crawl through them and so on. In fact, we encourage it because we're trying to set our hooks early, you know. And then, incidentally, you'll meet later for the badge pinning. His father is a Ramsey County uh, deputy, so there's a uh, family tradition of law enforcement in him. Uh, truthfully, um, well, actually, I'm sorry. As a young teen, he got involved with the police explorer post in Brooklyn Center. And again, uh, Kevin and I had the occasion to become reacquainted. Uh, we both recalled a job interview event that I used to run for the police explorer post. Uh, Kevin was probably 16 years old when I'm doing the mock job interview for in police exploring. But I remembered him and he remembered me. And again, it's that relationship piece that I try, try to take advantage of, and um, as we're, especially as we're looking for kids to, to pin a badge on and do this difficult job. Um, but through police exploring, he con confirmed his commitment to the law enforcement profession. After high school, he started at North Hennepin Community College where he earned his Associate of Arts in law enforcement. He attended skills at Hennepin Technical College, um, which is a related institution to that. Meanwhile, he was working as a community service officer in Brooklyn Center and subsequently joined their cadet program. He eventually was hired to work as a patrol officer there prior to joining us here in his hometown. Um, and I think you've heard this mentioned by me before, is that we like to think of Coon Rabbits PD as a destination organization. It was for me. I started somewhere else too and came back to my hometown. Um, we're working on our reputation, like I said, and it's something that we continue to strive for and build on. We're very happy to have both Anthony and Kevin become members of our department. Their training has pushed them to excel at meeting the needs of Coon Rapids. Our training program is designed to be an extremely uh, stressful process. To be certain, we've hired the right people that are ready to perform this vital job in what I've referred to many times as the Coon Rapids way. Um, which leads us to where we are here now. So Anthony and Kevin, tonight you're officially graduating from our field training program. Symbolically removed, removed your training badges if you, as you have now earned your permanent badges of 180 and 181 respectively. Two things about the badge though that I'm, you're about to be pinned with by your significant person. First, it represents the faith that everybody here has in you who's wearing a uniform. Um, we believe in your training. We believe in your knowledge base. We're ready to support you. But second and most importantly, never forget who the badge belongs to. The badge belongs to the citizens of this city and they're entrusting you with it. It's a somber and solemn uh, trust exercise and I, I need you to honor that trust and commitment. So you have become members of a proud organization, and I want you to know for me personally, I'll do everything I can, as will everyone else in this room will do everything they can to make sure you build successful careers here at Coon Rapids. So um, with that, our first pinning will be of Anthony, and pinning Anthony will be his fiance, Allison Phillips. So Anthony, I'm gonna have you walk up to the center here, and Allison, come to the center, and the mayor is gonna be, because you know that will happen. Well, I just wanted to make sure I had the right one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I am going to, yeah, go ahead and raise your right hand. And then uh, I'm going to hold this over here. And, and if I don't say it right, you go ahead and say it right. Sounds good. I, Anthony Pagapaz, do solemnly swear. I, Anthony Pagapaz, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And discharge faithfully. And discharge faithfully. The duties of a police officer. The duties of a police police officer. For the city of Coon Rapids. For the city of Coon Rapids. In the county of Anoka. In the county of Anoka. And the state of Minnesota. In the state of Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my ju judgment and ability. Congratulations.
Mr. Mayor, and the pinning of Kevin Melchez will be his father, both Jose and Melchez. So, <laughs> Councilmember Johnson is very conflicted. He loves being in Hawaii, but he just loves being here for badge paintings too, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready? Sir. All right. I, Kevin Noches, do solemnly swear. I, Kevin Noches, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And discharge faithfully. And discharge faithfully. The duties of a police officer. The duties of a police officer. For the city of Coon Rapids. For the city of Coon Rapids. In the county of Anoka. In the county of Anoka. And the state of Minnesota. And the state of Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and abilities. everybody being here for this though it is really a very big deal and thank you for being here thank you everybody if you want. <laughs> Agenda is the approval of the minutes from the December 7th meeting. Make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. I think I need a different motioner. You're an abstention. Oh, apologize, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> I like how you're right on top of it, though. Apologize, Mr. Mayor. I will move to approve the minutes. That's better. Oh, <laughs> motion by Johnson, second by Hernandez Jr. Any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, and that motion carries one abstention on uh, Councilmember Carlson. Um, we have two items on our consent agenda this evening. The first is uh, just to accept informational, um, informational information, there we go. Um, uh, city code requires that the city council be notified of any change in legal ownership or beneficial interest of a license holder and the license renewal applications indicated that following, the following corporate officers are new. Uh, at the Coon Rapids VFW post 9625 at 1919 Coon Rapids Boulevard, um, it is now Richard Lean Jr. and Shane Fields. And at Buffalo Wild Wings at 3395 River Rapids Drive, it is Catherine D. Jaspin. And that's just provided for information. And then the next item on our agenda is item four, and it's actually the second and last on our consent. And we're looking to approve a site lease with Verizon Wireless. Uh, Verizon has requested the city to place telecommunication antennas on the city's Crooked Lake Boulevard water tower at 11574 Crooked Lake Boulevard. City staff and Verizon have negotiated the attached lease to permit Verizon to place its facilities at that location. The highlights of the lease included an, an initial five-year term with three additional five-year options. Verizon shall pay an initial rent of $38,000 annually with a 3% increase each year thereafter. Tenant's use of the facility shall be subordinate to the city's use of the facility as well as other public safety and government agencies. 
When the lease has ended or is terminated by either party, Verizon shall be responsible to remove its equipment, repair, and restore the site. Uh, city staff believes it is in the best interest of the city to enter into the agreement with Verizon as it provides for enhanced telecommunication services for Verizon customers in the city while protecting city's assets. In addition, it furthers the city's goal of co-locating these types of telecommunication facilities on existing facilities. So we're looking to approve the site lease agreement with Celco Partnership doing business as Verizon Wireless for a telecommunication facility at the Crooked Lake Boulevard Water Tower and authorize the mayor and city manager to execute the agreement and any other necessary documents. Your Honor. Um, that was really a tie. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Ray Rower, go ahead. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Ray Rower, second by Geisler. Any discussion or questions? Mr. Mayor, I just Geisler. want to make sure that it's clear and if Mr. Brody needs to add anything in. Um, in our packet information, there was some reference to the Foley water tower. That is an error. It is the Crooked Lake water tower. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was in our minutes that, that we are correcting that. It, it made it tricky to read the uh, yeah. discussion yeah. points. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even I'm looking at it like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Day after I got back from vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and, and then just to, I, Mr. Himmer sent us some communication on this a while back. Um, and we're confident that this isn't going to add any noise elements no. to that. I mean, there is, they do have a generator, and obviously they're cons they've been made aware of it as well, Verizon has. And they've indicated, in fact, their Verizon representative is on the Zoom. Um, in case it was necessary that they're aware of that they you know there are other carriers there as well along the railroad track so everybody's aware of it we don't anticipate that it will certainly won't violate any city or state or any kind of noise uh, standards that way and like i said and everybody's aware of that and they're trying to do what they can to minimize that impact on the uh, neighboring properties okay thank you uh, any other discussion hearing none all in favor signify by saying aye Aye. Aye. Opposed? And the consent agenda is adopted. Item number five is to consider resolution 21-65 sub 8, accepting plans and specifications for fire station number three and authorizing solicitation of bids. Um, do you want me to read the discussion point, or do you want to just kind of, or somebody? Oh, we Mayor and Council, up. we have we have a, a dog and pony show we tonight. We do have a bit <laughs> of a <I> close. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mayor and Council, we do have representatives from our both our project team as well as our architect team. Uh, so this is Quinn. He's uh, been with us since the beginning of this project. So I asked him to provide a brief overview, and then we do have a, just a quick kind of fly through of the project itself. So I'll pass it on to Quinn. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. I uh, just have a, a quick overview of kind of what we've been through. We've worked uh, closely with you know staff, and uh, and certainly uh, with Council in, in previous meetings to uh, develop uh, this new fire station. And it's really been a joy working together. Quinn, just for the record, would you state your name and your company yep, name, though? It's absolutely Quinn Hudson with CNH Architects. Thank you. So um, as an overview, when we started the project, we had two really overarching primary goals, one of which was firefighter health, and the second was providing a, a facility that would meet the, the needs of the city of, of Coon Rapids, for, uh, certainly now, but well into the future. And to do that, uh, it was an appropriately uh, designed and, and developed building. Uh, on, the, on the overview of the firefighter health, we certainly spent a lot of time looking at toxin uh, removal and cancer prevention. Uh, we've, we've looked at, at mental health, quiet spaces, good sleep, uh, reduction of uh, PTSD. And then the other uh, firefighter health element, of course, is physical fitness. And so providing for uh, opportunities for the firefighters to remain uh, as fit as, as possible. Within the building uh, and, and the station design process, uh, we of course made sure that, that there was appropriate functions for all the elements that are important to the fire department and the uh, operations of the uh, fire staff. 
Uh, we also looked at designing a building that was durable, that would last uh, both in structure and materials for uh, a very long time to be, you know, well, uh, good use of uh, the investment that the city's making into the building. Uh, we also uh, spent uh, a lot of focus on sustainability so that we have a, a sustainable low energy use building that again uh, wisely uses the resources uh, uh, for the city. And finally, uh, we spent uh, a lot of effort to develop training features for this uh, new fire station that's going to allow a significant change in the amount of the training that occurs within the facility itself. Uh, we designed elements into other parts of the facility and uh, some air elements that we've added uh, specifically for training. But with, uh, with this facility, they'll be able to do uh, a lot more on-site training, allowing to remain uh, accessible to any calls that, that would be coming in and, and able to leave for that. So it allows uh, a lot more frequent training, better training, and with features that they otherwise uh, just didn't have the capability of doing. So it's really exciting to bring that piece to the pro process as well. As an update in process, where we've reached the completion of the design uh, for the building and I, I will maybe take a moment off here and and kind of do a quick we provided a uh, exterior video uh, walk through around the outside of the building about a, a quick a minute to, to, uh, Here's the first one up here so this will be walking ar around starting at the uh, kind of the public front parking the main entrance as we come on through here uh, you see the uh, historic apparatus display location through that uh, that has a prominent view from uh, both streets and now we're working our way around the apparatus bays uh, the central uh, visual tower in the front and working our way around the uh, end of the building so that was 111th Street's uh, main view we'll be looking at Mississippi Boulevard's uh, perspective as we come along here so this is the uh, end of the building the west side uh, with uh, all the development the towers on that side the back side of the facility uh, where the apparatus uh, return uh, training tower uh, so that was and, and hose drying tower but uh, uh, a lot of opportunities that you uh, see uh, placed in that uh, structure so quick overview uh, if you can walk around that quick after it's built that's pretty good we'll see so um, other than that, um, yeah, other things that uh, I talked about, are there other plans on this or just a video? I can bring up the other plans. If okay. You like um, I, floor plan wise, I'll just comment. Uh, we have, as you saw, the apparatus end of the building, and that's mostly looking at uh, in the, in the multiple bays. We have both uh, double deep bays for storing the large amounts of vehicles uh, and different apparatus, and then we have the drive through bays for the quick out, the regular response traffic to really uh, simplify that and, and, and make for a quick and, and safe response time. In the middle of that, there's a core portion that, that covers all the, the again, uh, a portion of health aspect, the decontamination of, of uh, the firefighter equipment areas, the firefighters themselves, uh, as well as uh, areas for um, maintain, maintenance of the SCBA equipment and other things like that. So that's the center part between the bays that you, know, you see up in front of you there. As we move into the uh, east side of the building the front half of the building is more of the operations side uh, again where we have offices a large training area for the classroom part of the, of the firefighter training as well as other uh, city uses and backup EOC uh, so a lot of functions in that front portion the lower portion includes the more of the living space the day the day room areas of, of the uh, uh, fire department so that'd be day room kitchen uh, and then some dorm areas uh, as well. So real quick overview uh, of the uh, layout. So thank you, Matt. Um, so other, uh, additionally, um, we've also been working uh, on, on our team is, is King Kong Construction, the CM for the project, and they've been up updating budget along the way. We just had an updated budget as we prepared to go out for bids. Uh, it came back uh, very, very close to the previous budget. So it just as a quick update, that's a hard cost of the building cost of uh, approximately 14.8 million. And then the overall soft, uh, total project cost that includes other soft costs like furniture, uh, design elements like that, that uh, brings the total project cost 
to uh, in, in that 15.9 million range. Again, very close to uh, you know right where it was in the last review of, of costs. So, with that, um, I'll give you a little update on, on timeline of, of what we're looking at. Obviously, we're here tonight to um, you know look for approval to go out for bids uh, with these completed construction drawings and documents. Um, just as a reminder, that does not commit the, the city or council to anything that just provides the opportunity to get those prices back and see, uh, um, take us on to that next step. But uh, so that, that's what we're, action we're looking for tonight. From there, um, you know, if, if approved, we will be looking at releasing the drawings uh, onto the market uh, on uh, uh, January 5th uh, and uh, go and start the bidding process. Bids are scheduled to be uh, received on January uh, 27th. Uh, and then Kinghorn, CNH, and the team would uh, evaluate the bids uh, and, and do our due diligence portions, look through that, and bring the results of the bids to the City Council meeting on uh, February 15th. That would be the point in which we'd be presenting the project for uh, actual approval to proceed with contracts. Uh, assuming that all proceeds, we'd have um, mobilization ordering uh, process going on from that mid-February range to uh, early April, uh, with groundbreaking uh, as soon as weather permits in, in April, uh, leading us through a uh, construction period that would end in the uh, uh, late spring of 23. So with that, that's my uh, uh programmed uh, presentation portion, but I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. All right. Do you have any questions on the presentation? Looks really cool. Okay. I was trying to trying to define where the fireworks were going to go off from. <laughs> the roof. I'm kind of a one track guy, <clears throat> you know. That is built in, Mayor. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Geiser. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 21 65 sub 8, approving plans and specifications and ordering the advertisement for bid for the replacement of fire station number three. Second. Second. All right. We have. It's, it's it probably a delay. He was probably <laughs> ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> I had to turn my screen off for a moment because I'm getting rained on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to give it to you. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. Um, discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Geisler. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've looked at this for a, a long time, and I know that, I mean, I had a couple of different frustrations. It's like, wait a minute, Mrs. Boulevard, and I want to thank um, the architect team to be able to adjust to the different requests from council and to be able to make sure that the fire chief and all of his team, that their needs got met and the city's needs got met. And I think we ended up with a, a, a good good end product, so. Absolutely. Yep. Mr. Mayor. Council Ray um, In reviewing this project, it, it really is an investment in our essential services. Um, our responder, our first responders are vital for the safety of our community. And what's really neat about this project is that it keeps in mind the safety of the people who are living and working there. Um, we talked a lot about cancer prevention and containment of toxins, and it's really set up to do those things. So it encompasses all of the health and well being um, of our firefighters, also. And it's a project that will meet our needs for a very long period of time when I think of an investment rather than it not meeting our needs in five to ten years so um, just very proud of the work that was done just makes me nervous if we have buildings that aren't going to be meeting our needs in five or ten years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mayor councilmember Johnson I just wanted to echo what councilmember Weller said I, this is an investment in the community uh, we did compare it to some of the other uh, fire departments that have been built in recent years and it's, it's in line uh, with the expense related to those but this uh, we expect to be a long-term investment for the future of the city and it's part of the, the institutions of the city and so i fully support moving forward with this this project thank you all right very good we have a motion and a second any other discussion on this 
Mr. Stemwettle. Mayor, Council, I'll just mention, obviously, as we proceed uh, at the end of January, we have sort of the, the fixed costs of the construction. Uh, we certainly will be able to give Council kind of that final view of what it will take to construct this, budget, uh, this building from a budgetary standpoint and financing and so forth, what portions might need to be bonded for, what portions might be funded through fund balance in the timing of all of that, because it's more than likely to get spread over two or three budgetary years. The other thing that uh, John and I and Aaron and others were just talking about this morning in, in the sense of good timing with this project is this past legislative session, uh, the legislature approved <clears throat> a sales tax reimbursement program for police and fire projects. Um, and so you basically you pay all the construction costs up front and then you keep track of them and you re get reimbursed for any sales tax. Um, as a part of that project. So there's things like that that haven't been factored in that would realize obviously a pretty significant savings to a project like this. There's a lot of things in motion right now, so it doesn't make sense to kind of get lost in some of that noise. But um, you know, as we get the final numbers for construction and we understand kind of where some of those components are at, we'll be able to detail that much more for council in about a month. All right, sounds good. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. We're still moving forward, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> all right, item six on our agenda is to consider resolution 21-133, approving the final plat for Brookside Place 12691 Hanson Boulevard, Brookside Construction. Um, does anybody need information you want me to read the discussion points here okay I'll just do that quick <laughs> <laughs> uh, November th well mr. Harlicker isn't here to come mm -hmm. up and do his thing mr. mayor I, mr. I, 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 may it can if you would like yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah but I think we, I mean we've kind of looked through this a number of times yeah. already mm -hmm. um, so on, uh, so on November 3rd council approved the preliminary plat for Brookside place uh, there is a church on the property that will be located on one lot and the remainder of the site will be platted into 11 townhome lots and another lot that makes up the common area. The lots comply with the dimensional and area requirements of the low density residential two district and the moderate density residential district. The church is located on lot one, which is 1.3 acres in size. And the and lot two is the townhome, townhome common area and lots three to 13 are the individual townhome lots the townhome development site is 1.86 acres, and we are looking at um, looking at final plat approval. And I don't know, does anybody have any questions, or somebody want to move well, it forward? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Rierauer, for planning case 21-44, I move to approve resolution 21-133, granting final plat approval for Brookside Place, with the following conditions. One, all engineering comments be addressed. Two, all comments from Anoka County Highway Department are addressed. Second. Motion by Ray Rower, second by Carlson. Um, Mr. Fernelius, is there anything that you want to add to that or anything? Or? No, Mr. Mayor, that was, a, that was a good summary. Well, it was your summary. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have anything to add. <laughs> all right, any other discussion from council? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And we are on to item seven. Consider planning case 21-47. Consider resolution 21-135, approving the final plat for Dory Edition, 11420 Round Lake Boulevard uh, for Darris Amsler. Um, and this is actually down on Mississippi Drive and Round Lake Boulevard. The applicant is proposing to subdivide a 1.97 acre parcel into three single family residential lots. There is an existing single family residence on the property along with three outbuildings. There are two detached buildings on lot one. Both of the buildings will be removed. The existing single family home will be located on lot two along with a detached garage. Lot three is undeveloped with frontage on the Mississippi River and the other two lots do not have river frontage. All three lots have frontage and access from Round Lake Boulevard. Um, there's more information here, but I don't know if anybody needs it. We've already 
been through this one a couple times. Yep. So, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Geiser, I'll make a motion to approve Resolution 21-135, granting final plat approval for Dory addition with three stated conditions. One, all engineering comments be addressed. Two, park dedication in the amount of $6,000 be paid prior to releasing the plat for recording. And three, one street tree is required for each lot to be planted at the time of the building permit. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Griscoviak. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, opposed? And that motion carries. And we are up to item eight to consider resolution 21 130, approving year end budget appropriations. Ms. Um, Hansen, you want to sure. hit those highlights? Yes, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, each year, in accordance with the city's administrative order, no activity expenditures in the general fund in the categories of personal services, cost of goods sold, other charges and services, supplies and capitals may exceed budgetary amounts. Staff reappropriates budgeted funds in order to get all activities in compliance with this city administrative order. In 2021, we have enough available funds in each category to reappropriate funds to all activities that did exceed their 2021 budgets. During this process, um, staff also projects our year-end revenue and expenditures for the general fund. This year we anticipate we'll have excess funds available of approximately $1.4 million. This is primarily due to personal services vacancies, mostly in our police department, and a reduction in our seasonal hirings due to ongoing labor shortages, and um, that's affiliated with, of course, the ongoing COVID situation. Um, excess amounts over the city's 45% fund balance may be transferred to other funds, such as in the past we've done at the Facility Construction Fund, to subsidize our ongoing facility repairs and improvement. Um, something that should be noted, uh, um, this $1.4 million excess does not include the $3.2 million we received in May for the American Rescue Plan Act funds, which will, de will determine what to do with those um, in the near future. Um, one final, um, thing, the 2021 um, reappropriations are not final. We'll come back to council in March when we determine what our final numbers are and we will do a new resolution for those at that time. Anybody have any questions about that? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Member Carlson. I make a motion that we adopt resolution number 21-130. Reappropriating funds within the 2021 general fund budget and amending the 2021 budget. Second. Motion by Carlson, second by Johnson. Any, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Item number nine is to consider resolution 21-134, approving the 2022 compensation plan for unrepresented employees. Um, well, Good Lori evening, Mr. Tonight. Mayor and Council. <laughs> Um, as it relates to resolution number 21-134, we're asking for approval from council for a 3% annual COLA. Um, this is an annual wage adjustment. It's consistent with what we're seeing um, in the market in terms of COLA adjustments and what we're seeing um, contracts settle for. This is for unrepresented um, personnel. And this is kind of in line with all of our other contracts this year, isn't it? Mayor and Council, uh, we don't have any settled contracts for 2022. We're in the midst of, uh, we have four unions and two of which we're in negotiations with now, the other two of which will start um, shortly. You know, in terms of the offers that we've uh, given so far, yes, it is in line with the 3% that we've offered so far, but we don't have any of those settled. settled. Oh, we have okay, not settled, right. yes. <laughs> all right. I remember conversations. Yes, <laughs> there's been conversations. <laughs> yeah. All right. Your Honor. Councilmember Ray Rower. I motion the approval of resolution 21 134 establishing the 2022 compensation plan for unrepresented employees. Second. Motion by Ray Rower, second by Geisler. Discussion? Hearing no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
and that motion carries. Item 10 is to consider the Civic Center stove purchase and resolution 21-132 amending the 2021 general fund budget. Man, these appliances are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a cheap one. But Stephanie, go ahead. Um, good Stephanie. evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we are asking Council to um, consider the stove purchase because there's basically three main reasons. Um, it is getting quite old, so we need to prepare for new equipment. We also have had some changes in business operations. We just don't need a stove that has 10 burners and two ovens. Um, we don't do the same types of um, meal plans. A lot of times when people rent the facility, they're using warmers or they have pre-made meals through caterers and they're bringing them in. Um, and then the third reason is that it's a constant pilot light type of system, which is on all the time and it honestly causes confusion for our renters and our users there's also a gas smell and people often think something is wrong and it has caused 911 calls and um, sometimes officers are responding so there's all these factors in play and because of that um, staff researched other options and this stove would be smaller it would be six burners and one oven and we still think we need a stove to have flexibility for renters and of course you need a caterer's license to use the appliance so nothing's changing with those operations and um, due to some um, funding that we had we thought this would be a good way to uh, purchase that stove and it would set us up for success for many years into the future, eliminate those problems with the, the gas pilot lights being on all the time. It would have a battery spark ignition. So if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer. For some time into the future, I think we're looking for 30 years again, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Council. Mr. Stemwettle. I was just going to mention that uh, there was actually some savings or uh, I guess leftover budget in the 2021 uh, facility Civic Center facility fund for this. However, was not uh, listed in the capital replacement schedule. And so uh, I don't have authority, if that's the case, to simply make that purchase. So that's why it's coming to council in this format, although it's not, yes, I will grant you, uh, it's a higher dollar level. But in terms of the type of equipment we typically see uh, on our capital plan, um, that's why you're seeing it tonight. Council? Mr. Mayor? Council Member Griscoviak? Um, I'm just wondering, why didn't we see this in the 2022 uh, budget that we just worked through? If it's a 30-year-old unit, so <coughs> just wondering why it's coming up now as amending the 2021 instead of being in the 2022. Mm -hmm. Steph, do you want me to answer? Sure, go ahead and answer that. <laughs> uh, Mayor Council, actually, um, Stephanie and I had that uh, exact discussion back in June. Um, it was a this has been in and out of a budget for probably about five years now, hmm. um, but for various reasons, we thought, well, we can get along with the, the one we have. So the discussion Steph and I had uh, this year was that um, you know, if there's remaining funds in that budget, let's try to get it done this year so um, we can move ahead with it. We went to a little later in the year than maybe we had anticipated just because there are other things going on, um, but that way we could take it out of the 22 if we had the savings this year and just go ahead and purchase it. So that was kind of the thought process to it is keep it out of the 22 and, and use some of the dollars we had excess from this year. Very good. Okay. Your Honor. Council Member Ray Brower. I make a motion to approve purchasing the Civic Center gas stove with battery spark ignition, amending <clears throat> the 2021 general fund budget with resolution 21-132. Second. Motion by Ray Rauer and a second by Carlson. Is there further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Kraskoviak. I'll just have to say that if, if it's been in and out of the budget for the last five years, for us not to see it anywhere in the 2022 budget kind of throws me off a little bit here. Um, it, we do this every so often where we just throw something in at the end of the 2021 year. You know, it affects, you know, the 2022 budget and our, you know, what we're trying to do with our residents in terms of taxing. So um, I would have liked to have seen this in the 2022 budget, and then we could have taken it out of the 22 budget, put it in the 2020. Okay. Is there any other discussion on this? Um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. And the motion carries one, um, what do they call those? No votes, abstentions, <laughs> not nays. nays, one nay. Council Member Kraskoviak. 
We don't have those very often. Nope, we don't. <laughs> um, item 11 is to consider resolution 21-131, authorizing participation in the National Prescription Opioid Settlement. Um, Mr. Brody, do you want to hit the highlights or do you want to? I can, Your Honor. Uh, Mayor, Council members, as you recall back in 2019, the city of Coon Rapids did become involved in the uh, in its own lawsuit against the manufacturers of and distributors of opioids. Obviously, we as a city are affected by it. The county is affected by this uh, opioid crisis. And so this council made a decision to, uh, to become part of that litigation. Now, here a couple years later, um, there is a settlement proposal with involving a couple of the, or four of the manufacturers and one of the, uh, um, one of the uh, other parties, uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, to provide a settlement pool and so over the last several months there's been a lot of discussion with the state in terms of how that would work here in Minnesota and um, they've come up with this solution and it's actually fairly it's more than fairly it's it's favorable to the city initially it was going to be sort of a 60 40 split uh, with the funds the funds are now being split 75 25 percent with 75 percent of it going to the cities and counties and 25 percent going to the state um, initially, they were talking about every city over the, with a population of 10,000 or more. Now it's 30,000 or more so that the money doesn't get diluted too much. And so we were able to, as a litigating party um, between our attorney and also the city of Duluth on our behalf, uh, advocate for that. For that. And so, um, frankly, there's not a lot of choice here unless we want to take on these manufacturers ourselves. And I'm guessing that's not our option. So in some ways, we're here, you know, like I said, with... But on the other hand, it's a really good outcome. We, I think better than what we would have imagined when we first got involved um, a couple of years ago. It's not in the memo, um, other than there's a per, sort of a percentage that we're, we're in, um, slotted to get, and it's 0 .5773. To put that into dollars, which I've now got some information, it could be roughly about 1.1 million over the 18 years, or approximately 67,000 a year that would come directly to the city of Coon Rapids. Now, naturally, we need to spend that on particular items and that can be a discussion down the road of once we get kind of over these initial stages of just getting involved or getting the settlement through. Um, so I think that is and that's a you know this is just a, a couple of manufacturer or four manufacturers and then Johnson and Johnson this would probably set up the framework for future um, settlements with you know Purdue, uh, Purdue and, and the a couple of the other uh, uh, companies out there. So uh, like I said we think it's favorable um, the other thing is, is the attorneys are paid out of a separate pool, so none of you know, the funds that we'll receive will be our funds. We won't have to pay a portion of that for attorneys' fees to, to our attorney who did represent us on this matter. Um, with that, if there's any questions, otherwise uh, there is a resolution that we're asking you to, uh, to approve. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Johnson, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I would uh, move to approve resolution 21-131 authorizing participation in the National Prescription Opioid Settlement authorizing staff to execute all the documents necessary for that purpose. Second. Motion by Johnson and a second by Geisler. Um, Mr. Brody, thank you for bringing this up when you did. When, at the time, I thought, what are we doing getting and going down this road? But uh, it, it made, made a lot of sense. So um, any other discussion? Yeah. Oh, Councilmember Johnson? Yeah, I want to also uh, echo that. Uh, I think it's really important for the public to understand that uh, we have a city attorney and a city manager who have been really looking out for the city and looking to protect the not just the rights, um, but also the interests of the city um, and the consequences for things like um, the opioid crisis and its impact on the city and, and being aware of the option to participate in the opioid um, settlement and um, in the litigation it was a really good thing for them to bring the council and to, to inform us um, about the options that we might have back in 2019 and as um, as everybody here can see um, that was uh, a very good thing for the city of Twin Rapids so I would hope that we would all continue to be supportive of this and, and get behind uh, signing on for the settlement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sum of money as well, which is good. Obviously, that benefits us here in Coon Rapids as well. Yep. 
Yeah, I went through and highlighted those yeah, the yeah. people. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Griscoviak. I definitely agree with you and Council Member on the being proactive on all this. Uh, I think I saw another memo on this. Uh, League of Minnesota Cities, their advice on this, their stance on this is a recommend just as you are recommending this, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, just wanted to clarify Frankly, that. the more cities that sign on, and it's non-litigating cities obviously also get to take advantage of this. They weren't at the table though specifically to help negotiate how that would be distributed. But the more cities, the more counties that sign on, the bigger share that the state of Minnesota gets. And so it benefits everybody by having more cities participate. And that's, so that's been the league's recommendation. Obviously our council's recommendation and certainly city staff's. Thank you. Very good. All right, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And we are up to the open mic public comment. We went from a very full house to a very empty house. <laughs> so I'm going to assume there is nobody here for open mic. I do not have any reports on previous open mics. And we are up to other business. Um, Council other business? Your Honor. Council Member Ray Rower. Yeah, I'd just like to remind everyone to be safe over the holiday season and uh, take care of yourself and your loved ones. Uh, we do have a spike in the COVID-19 cases happening. And um, like for example, myself, we're gonna take some at-home COVID tests before we all get together with the family, uh, just preventing passing it on to grandma and grandpa. So just something to think about in our community. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Geisler. Um, just a, a couple other, you know, always go out to the, the city website and there's all kinds of great information that you can have out there. Um, there's the holiday light contest that's going on. And so there's all a map that will give you all of the addresses for all of the, the houses that have the fabulous Christmas lights out. And so you can do that as a safe drive through with, with your family, taking all of those great displays in. Um, our ice rinks should be opening on the December 27th. So for those of you who are wanting to get out and skate, the, we should have the ice rinks um, opening up. All right. Um, and then I would just like to uh, thank everyone. On Saturday, December 11th, we had our first ever tree lighting in the community. Although there were some some rumors that maybe there was one that happened back in the 60s at the old fire station, but we don't have any record of that. So not that I've found anyway. Um, but we had our first tree lighting Saturday, December 11th. Uh, and I wanna thank the Community Strength Foundation for sponsoring the event. Um, and there was a whole crew of people that worked on the uh, on organizing it. Um, and then I've just kinda got a list where we need to thank the Public Works Department, the Streets Department, and CTN Studios. Uh, the Coon Rapids Fire Department, who stepped up and uh, drove Santa in and helped with the, so many things. Um, the uh, Coon Rapids Police Department and the Police Reserve. Bill Ganser and the Coon Rapids Ice Center employees. Um, we ended up with something called Rocky's Santa Den. We didn't have a thing for Santa to, to be in out there. And uh, Tiffany Fick stepped up and just found somebody, found supporters, and uh, in four days um, took on the task of getting a Santa shack built. Um, Jake and Sarah Couch and their family stepped up to construct the house in record time. Coon Rapids Lowe's stepped up and put all the materials together for us at 10% below cost which is a significant savings. Um, and then the sponsors came forward, Coon Rapids Rotary Club, Coon Rapids 5K, Coon Rapids Fire Relief Fund, Coon Rapids North Star Lions, and JD Roofing and Construction all donated. Uh, somebody, uh, Karen Carlson stepped up and did some amazing and beautiful hand painting of the scenes inside and outside the Santa Den. If you looked in there, it was beautiful. Fireplace, Christmas tree, they glued lights onto the tree. It was just wonderful. Um, 
and Okahannepin Schools National Honors uh, Society students for keeping the hot chocolate, cider, and cookies moving. Uh, Boy Scout Troop 406 for keeping guard over the Santa Den and ensuring that young and old alike had their opportunity to visit Santa and his elves. Uh, the Coon Rapids High School Choir Raven Street Project under the direction of Amy Johnson was amazing and they did uh, almost an hour of music. Um, Amy Linzo for capturing the photo memory. She took all the pictures of all of Santa's visitors and then her sons Ben and Sam were in the Rocky the Raccoon and Snowy the Snowman costumes. Um, thank you to everyone who came. Thank you to everyone who came and donated to the Coon Rapids High School food shelf. Uh, we also had Miss Coon Rapids Leah Mao there and Miss Coon Rapids Princess Haley for stopping by. Um, and we can't forget Santa who sat out there for two hours and his family who were the elves and uh, um, it, it was just absolutely wonderful. And we're just really hoping that this is going to go somewhere and that we have an even bigger event next year. Um, it, was a, it, it was really nice. It was like a Bedford Falls evening <laughs> in town. And I uh, really, really appreciated it. It was uh, a Hallmark movie. The <laughs> Hallmark? Yeah, yeah, Hallmark? Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, so it was a great night. And, uh, and it, it, it was Coon Rapids staff really stepped up and filled in all the gaps. and covered so many things thank you so much uh, mr. Stemmel you have your hand up uh, yeah mayor council I was uh, just going to mention that we've been getting some questions about snow plowing recently with some of the snowfalls that we had so I thought I'd just take a minute to kind of discuss what the city policy is um, over the weekend you know some areas of the city probably saw two plus inches of snow and so there are questions about when do the city plows come out uh, the operative number for our streets department is three or more inches and that snow emergency will get called and so at that point at three or more inches or if there's a winter weather advisory uh, we'll do an all call we'll bring in the plows we do the residential streets we do the main streets when it's less than three inches um, that's where we we do call crew members in but they are focused on the arterial or the main roads problem spots bridges things like that um, when we have you know when it's a dusting or a half an inch people probably don't pay a whole lot of attention to it when you get about two inches they get a little sloppy and they wonder where are the plows um, so that's really the city policy it's been that way for a number of years um, when we do have those more significant smaller uh, snowfall amounts we will come out that next business day and do the residential streets um, and things of that nature but it may be a day or two as it was the case this weekend um, again, if it's more than three inches, that's when you see them out there early on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Obviously, if it falls during the business week, it's a little easier because it's just the next business day or that night they're out there, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, that's a policy that we, we discuss at a city level, at a council level, probably every couple of years. Um, but I think it's just uh, the same questions come up. I know I got asked that question in my neighborhood. Hey, when do the plows come out? And I said, well, probably Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. I mean, it, it's just one of those things, that, especially when it's early in the season. So we like to remind folks about that. We also like to remind folks that there is no overnight parking this time of year. Um, you can really help out our streets crews by not parking overnight. Um, and you'll actually make your neighbors happier too. So you don't have that kind of wing row around a car in the middle of the street, uh, all summer creating ruts and that sort of thing. Um, if you would Anybody, whether it be council or those at home, would like any more information, that policy is detailed out on our city website. So if you go there, you can go to the city services area, kind of click down to public works and streets. There's a whole section on snow plowing that goes through all of that detail. And then uh, the second update I have, Mayor and Council, is we have a couple of holidays coming up. City offices will be closed both this Friday and next Friday, uh, one in recognition of the Christmas holiday and the other for New Year holiday. I wanted to just button up that the, the snow plowing thing. Yeah. And I think, like you mentioned, it was the perfect thing that the snow came early in the weekend, you know, Friday night, and it was just below our threshold. So it seemed, you know, it's as bad as it gets, really. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing with the snow plowing is I wanted to mention, just like in the summer when you mow your grass, you don't blow your grass clippings out into the street. In the winter, when you clear your driveway, you do not blow the snow or shovel the snow into the street. Mm -hmm. I don't point. I don't understand why people do that. <laughs> you know, I, I literally, I'll drive by and I'll just see it. They, they just keep blowing everything out into the street. You're going, where do you think that's going to go? Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't get it. 
And I, but I, I don't stop and yell at him either. So <laughs> I glare. I glare at him when I drive by. <laughs> give him the look. I give him the look. <laughs> so, all right. Any other business to come before council this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor. House from uh, on the On the tree lighting, I know you can't thank everyone that was no. volunteering for that or that, you know, we'd be here all night. But uh, I did want to just say uh, that we, we borrowed those fire pits from the city of Anoka. And the fires that we had in there, a lot of people mentioned to me how nice that was because it was mm -hmm. kind of cold out there. But those fire pits, those big concrete things, really put out a lot of heat. There was people standing around them, families, at a, you know, and they're safe. So I just wanted to give a call out to uh, the city of Anoka for borrowing those to us. Very good. And that's one of the things we'll probably try and grow next year is we'll probably have twice as many fires. <laughs> <laughs> but that'll be in our January meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Well, if we have no other business to consider. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> motion, motion by Johnson, second by Geisler to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And we will see you next year. <laughs>